Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, Rahm Emanuel has been nominated for Worst Politician Ever. I'm kidding. He has been nominated for Ambassador to Japan. Will the U.S. Senate go along with that? Our guest, Delmarie Cobb, is a journalist from Chicago. She owns and operates the Publicity Works and is president of Delico Communications, which produced the award-winning nationally televised news magazine program Street Life on PBS affiliates. In 1988, she was national traveling press secretary to presidential candidate Jesse Jackson. She has a, a long resume. She writes a column called Chicago Colors, uh, Delmarie Cobb, welcome to Talk World Radio. Oh, thank you for having me. So you have been writing about some of Rombo's outrages in Chicago for years, especially the case of Laquan McDonald. Uh, can you remind listeners what happened? Yes. Uh, well, Chicagoans found out about McQuan, Laquan McDonald almost a year after it had happened, the incident had happened. And the only reason we found out is because of some enterprising journalists and activists who knew about the incident and were insistent that the dash cam video from the police uh, cars uh, become public. And right before um, they became public, of course, all of a sudden there was a flurry of activity with the Cook County State's Attorney's Office and City Hall. But the other thing that took place is that the uh, mayoral election was happening uh, in 2015, and there was a runoff. And the runoff wa means that during the actual election, you got less than 50%. So both candidates got less than 50%. And for Rahm Emanuel, it was a re-election campaign. And the person who was running against him uh, was Jesus Chuy Garcia, who is now a congressman. Um, and at the time, he was a Cook County commissioner. And he was not as well known as Rahm Emanuel citywide, but he forced Rahm Emanuel into a runoff because that was an idea. That was an example of how much Rom was disliked. And so imagine if the information about the video and Laquan McDonald had become public during that time. Rahm Emanuel would not have been reelected. So five days after the election, the Corporation Council goes to the Finance Committee and asks for a $5.5 million settlement for Laquan McDonald's family without ever a legal action being taken by the family. So in other words, this was hush money. Yeah. Five days later, after the election. But Rahm Emanuel claims he never saw the video, didn't know about the video, and it wasn't a cover-up. Yeah, but it was a cover-up, uh, a cover-up <laughs> of a murder, right? Pretty clearly. Oh, uh, Laquan McDonald, when we saw the video, when it became public, I mean, the, the whole city went up in arms because clearly uh, not only did you have all these police officers who were on the scene at the time, but and they had been talking to Laquan McDonald for about 30 minutes. But then Jason Van Dyke, who was the officer who shot him, literally you see his car come to drive up on the scene, him jump out the car. I mean, literally the car is still moving when he jumps out the car and immediately starts shooting Laquan McDonald, who was walking in the other direction. So six seconds after he arrived, he assessed the situation that the other police officers had been at for 30 minutes. And in that amount of time, he decided that Laquan McDonald needed to be killed. He was shot 17 years old. He was shot 16 times. He had a pocket knife in his hand. As I said, he was walking the other way. The police narrative was that Laquan McDonald was lunging at the police, and that's why they shot him for fear of their lives. The dash camera showed something quite different. <laughs> narrative being the polite word for made-up <laughs> story that's not in the video, right? 
<laughs> right. Uh, and and you wrote, Delmarie Cobb, in one of your columns, uh, Chicago Colors, you wrote uh, about Rahm Emanuel that he blamed protesters of police uh, or, or of police-involved killings, as they call it, uh, for for the increase in Chicago's gun violence. The, the protesters were the problem. Yes, we're the problem because uh, the police... Uh, their morale now is so low uh, that, you know, they just can't do their jobs anymore. And as a result of them not being able to mentally do their jobs, um, uh, violence and crime have escalated in the city of Chicago. And my response to that is, why wasn't the morale low when you had police officers lying and covering up crimes? Why wasn't the morale low then? Everybody talks about there only being a few bad apples and that the police get brushed with a broad, claw, a, a, a broad brush because of the few bad apples. But my response to that is then why don't the good police then eliminate the bad police? If they don't, if they feel like they're being un, un um, uh, what should I say? If they feel like they're not the ones who should be accused of being bad police or police misconduct or police involved shootings, then why aren't they the ones who are taking the lead to get rid of the bad police? And instead, what we see over and over again is that they actually are protecting the bad police. In the case of Laquan McDonald, all the police wrote on their police reports the same narrative that Laquan McDonald was lunging at him and they feared for their lives. Mm -hmm. And yet when he was shot and hit the ground, not one police officer went to him to see how he was doing, if he was alive, if he could have been saved. The only thing that happened is one officer walked over to him and kicked the gun, I mean, kicked the knife out of his hand. And that was the only approaching uh, officer uh, during the whole scene. A whole bad apple orchard, it seems like. Uh, <laughs> we, you, Delmarie Cobb, you, you, in one of your columns, brought up Emmett Till. I mean, you see echoes of, of that long ago horror in, in this new one? Well, it just doesn't stop. And, and, and there's just been a continuation of it since, uh, throughout history. And and um, and and I and black people have been saying this throughout history and no one believed it because the the belief is, oh, you must have done something wrong. I mean, the police would never do that. And it's only because of video cameras and 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 cell phones and surveillance cameras that the truth is finally coming out that, no, people don't have to do anything wrong. People are being killed for uh, infractions that certainly don't rise to their death. I mean, selling loose squares, selling videotapes, uh, having a, not turning on a turn signal, um, uh, having a knife in your hand, but walking the other way, um, all, uh, being in your home, sleep, looking at a construction site, those do not rise to the occasion for somebody to be killed. But if you're black, it does. And, and this, this cover-up of this murder by Rahm Emanuel, this wasn't some sort of aberration in an otherwise noble, admirable political career that benefited us all, was it? Well, the thing is, is in Chicago, since 2004, we have spent, taxpayers have spent $1 billion in uh, uh, settlements and legal fees for these police involved shootings and police misconduct. $1 billion. So if you're a mayor and you come in and you inherit that situation, it, you would imagine that if you were actually a mayor who was for the people, that would be one of the first things you would want to address. You wouldn't come in and continue, uh, uh, you know, business as usual 
And that's what Rahm Emanuel did. He came in and continued business as usual when it came to the police. Even after Laquan McDonald, our attorney general, who uh, at the time was Lisa Madigan, she immediately said that we needed to have a um, uh, have the Justice Department look into it. And he told her um, he, his response was he didn't think that was necessary. It wasn't until the next day or so, I believe Hillary Clinton said, yes, it is necessary. And then suddenly he said, well, yeah, yeah, I guess it would be a good thing to do. But th- that this is someone who's, whose other policies were generally disastrous, right? I mean, who closed endless, closed lots of public schools, especially in black neighborhoods, whose, who, whose general approach to the job was, was not helpful, right? His general approach to the job was to, to actually hurt the black community, and that's what he did every chance he got. Um, and the only reason he got into office in the first place is because African Americans in Chicago, knowing that he had been in the Barack Obama administration, believed that he would have the resources and the contacts to bring some of those resources back to the city of Chicago. The majority of black people had no idea who Rahm Emanuel was. I, of course, did because this is what I do for a living. And I went on radio and was saying, no, 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 please don't do this. And um, and I said, you know, after 22 years, we're free, <laughs> please. Uh, and and at that time, Miguel de Valle was running against him uh, in 2011. And Miguel de Valle didn't win. And then in 2015, it was uh, Jesus Garcia who ran against him. But who was going to run against him in 2015 was uh, Karen Lewis, who was the uh, head of the C- of the Chicago Teachers Union. And the reason she rose to fame is really because of Rahm Emanuel. He came in picking a fight with her. And, uh, and I believe to this day that the reason he decided that he was going to make his reputation as a tough guy on the back of, a, of, of uh, Karen Lewis was because she was black and she was a woman. And the majority of teachers are black and women. And he figured they were the most vulnerable. So I'm going to come in and I'm going to be tough guy and I'm going to put her in her place. And immediately, one of the first things they did was he did was to um, go to Springfield and pass legislation that would make it harder for uh, the teachers to strike that they would have to have 75% of the rank and file to vote in order to strike. That was the first thing he did. The second thing he did was extend the extent, there was going to be a bill that allowed for an extended school day. That bill had passed. It was already going to take place, but it wasn't going to go into effect until the next year. He decided it was going to go into effect immediately. And so he came in and he was going to, Uh, extend the school day. Now, a lot of people didn't want him to extend the school day because they saw it as warehousing children, some of them. And then white families saw it as, you know, I don't need my child in an extended school day. I've got them in all these other after school activities and I want them to do that. So people were not necessarily for it. Um, But he, his whole thing was, this is going to allow them to learn because they'll be in school longer. So the kids who are, 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 uh, who have the hardest time learning, who are in the worst schools, they're going to now have more time to learn. So that's how he was selling it. And, you know, and when, whenever you can't get, uh, um, broad support for something, always make it about the children. And so that's what, that's what he did. And, uh, so he went up and he got a couple of schools to immediately, to implement the longer school day. Now, he was paying the principals $150,000 as a bonus if they did it. Uh And as it turns out, only about 14 schools did it out of 400 schools. But because he sent a news release out every day that he got a, a school to do it, it made it seem like, oh, there's this groundswell 
of support for me. And uh, finally, you know, it just didn't happen. I mean, people really saw, saw it for what it was. But anyway, that's how Karen Lewis uh, made her claim to fame. And he said to her at one point, well, face, is, face it, Karen, 25% of the students aren't going to make it anyway. And that's when they really became enemies because what he was saying in effect is 25% are going to go to private placement schools, private, private enrollment schools. 25% are going to go to um, charter schools. 25% are going to go to advanced placement schools. And 25% are going to go to neighborhood schools. And those are the 25% who aren't going to make it because I'm going to close the majority of the neighborhood schools, which he did. He closed 50 schools more so than any other mayor in the city, in, in, in the nation. And they were mostly in black and brown communities. Yeah. I, I thought the countries that had the best schools, like Finland, had the shortest school days. I don't know. what <laughs> You know, I, I remember this guy with these same tactics going back to the Bill Clinton days. And, and I remember 2006, when we elected majorities of Democrats in the U.S. Congress uh, with the top issue of all the exit polls being end the war in Iraq. And I remember the Washington Post in January 07, Rahm Emanuel, he wasn't quoted, but paraphrased by the Washington Post columnist, essentially said, we're not going to end the war. We just got elected to end. We're going to escalate it so we can run against it again in two years uh, because it's a Republican war. So and, and so a guy who would facilitate hundreds of thousands of murders, uh, as I see it, that he would cover up one murder. It wasn't really shocking to me. I mean, this seems like who he's been for years, right? Oh, it is who he's been. I mean, here's somebody who embraces the fact that he is abusive and 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 vulgar. I mean, everybody knows that he is, uh, and and he embraces that reputation. He doesn't run from it. Well, who's who's speaking out and who's keeping quiet on this outrageous <laughs> nomination for ambassador to Japan? I mean, he was not, he, they floated his name for some White House position and people said, oh, no. But then they decided, well, Japan is he's OK. He's good enough for that. Right. I mean, who's who's opposing this and who's not? Well, when his first when his name first got floated for secretary of transportation, uh, I, I immediately said no. And I was so glad to see that a lot of others uh, said no. And uh, AOC was one of them who said no immediately. And what has been very disappointing uh, to me is how many local people have not said a word yeah. here in Chicago yeah. and Illinois have not said a word. Uh, so I am glad that progressives around the country are saying no to this nomination and you know, I understand that when um, the initial pushback to Secretary of State happened, uh, Biden, you know, walked away and said it's just not worth it because, of course, he had just gotten in and he got in with the black vote. And we know he got in with the black vote. He would not have been president had it not been for the black vote. Mm -hmm. And so but, you know, there are some very important, powerful people who are whispering in his ear who are supportive of Rahm Emanuel. And they're trying to make the case, you know, let's help rehabilitate his reputation because that's what this is about. This is not about rewarding somebody who's done a good job. In fact, he's done a terrible job. He was a failed mayor. And the reason he didn't run a third term is because he knew he was going to lose miserably. And so that's why he didn't run. And, and he wanted to save face. And that's what this is about, saving face, rehabilitating his reputation. And as Norman Solomon said, who is one of the progressives of Roots Action, who's fighting against his nomination, he said he's still relatively young, which means he could come back again and run for Illinois senator or he could run for governor or he could run for something else. So, so you know, the whole idea is to make sure he never rises again, not put him in a position that he can then use uh, as, a, as a pedestal to catapult him to something else that we have to then live with again here in Illinois.
please don't do that to us. <laughs> <laughs> and but you're you're a Democrat, right, Delmarie Cobb? You worked on Absolutely. Hillary Clinton's campaign in '16, right? Uh, and you're right. speaking out against Rahm Emanuel. But where are the leaders of the Democratic Party? Do you think? Do you think Republican senators will turn against him because he's so obnoxious and he's a Democrat? Do you think Democratic senators will go along or will they reject him? I, I think Congressman Jamal Bowman, I think, has has tweeted, you can either care about black lives or support Rahm Emanuel's nomination. Pick one. You can't you can't do both. <laughs> but it, 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 as far as I know, most of them are, are keeping pretty quiet. Right. Right. It's been very disappointing. Um, be, and it was disappointing to see uh, Congressman Clyburn uh, immediately tweet his support for Rahm Emanuel. And and so, you know, what you've got is you've got people like, of course, uh, former President Bill Clinton and uh, Illinois Senator Dick Durbin and uh, President, uh, former President Barack Obama. And I mean, those are just a few of the people who are in um, Biden's ear, probably uh, saying, you know, give him another chance. Uh, and that's the same thing um, Barack Obama said as president to Chicagoans when he ran for reelection in 2015. Uh, he said, give him another chance. He's just hard headed. And and I was incensed then because I'm I'm like what he's done to the black community is not hard headed. What he's done to the black community is actual disdain for the black community, and we need to understand that he's shown nothing but disdain at every opportunity. One of the last things he did before he left Chicago as mayor was he fast tracked a two point four billion dollar TIF two TIFs for two different developments in the city of Chicago on the north side. Uh, so south side is black, west side is black, north side is white. On the north side for two major developments for private developers. Imagine what $2.4 billion would do in the black community. But we're going to create two new developments, in fact, two new communities, because these are such major developments that they're actually going to create two new communities and the majority of people who will be in those communities will not be black and that is what he took pride in is that he was bringing all these IT companies to Chicago every minute he was announcing you know bringing another IT company or another headquarter from the suburb but they weren't creating jobs they weren't creating jobs, and they certainly weren't creating jobs for black people. All they were doing were transferring jobs from the suburbs to the city. Yeah. Well, we, we need people in Chicago and around the entire United States to be telling their senators no on this, right? I, I know at, at RootsAction.org, where I work and where Norman Solomon works, uh, people can click a button and email their senators uh, and hopefully call them on the phone as well. Um, but are, are a lot of people uh, still paying attention to, to the Rahm Emanuel problem now? Do you think we're going to get enough phone calls and emails into senators on this? Well, that's, you know, I think that's the strategy is to make sure. Um, well, first of all, the strategy was to announced this on a Friday afternoon mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, you know, it went under the radar. That was the first strategy. The other part of the strategy is probably not uh, in the hands of, of uh, uh, humans. Uh, it just happens to be fate that so many major things are going on at, the, at this time in, in, our, in the world and in our lives that, you know, this could squeak by. But we're trying to make sure that it stays top of mind because this is not something we want to squeak by. Yeah. Because if we let this squeak by, we will be living with the repercussions of this for a long time. Uh, because I do believe that this is setting Rahm Emanuel up for something bigger. And we cannot allow him. This, this would be disqualifying for anybody else. And we cannot allow him to walk away from the murder of Laquan McDonald and the murder of black communities, because the repercussions, we are still feeling them in Chicago from him being the mayor. 
uh, when you talk about the 50 schools, he also closed six of 12 mental health clinics. And as I say, who needs more mental health care than black and brown people who are underemployed, underserved, and under siege? And, and when he got elected and he got reelected, you wrote about in your column, still Marie Cobb, about the slick television ads he used <laughs> uh, that apparently meant more to a lot of people than taking a look at his campaign website or his record of performance in the world. Uh, why do people fall for this stuff, uh, personality and, and fluff when they're dealing with a guy with, with, a, with a policy record and a policy platform? You know, and that's the most uh, disappointing thing in my whole career. Mm. <laughs> you know, after 30 years of doing this, uh, being a political consultant, is how we still fall for things that we shouldn't fall for and how we listen to people who we shouldn't listen to and don't listen to the people who are actually in the trenches with you who are saying no. Uh, and, 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 and I hope, you know, if I have any wish... That's my one wish is that I hope that we as voters become more, we've got to become more uh, nuanced. We've got to become more curious. We've got to, you know, really do our homework and not, because I always say that whether you're in the private sector or public sector, you have a record. And so you can't say, well, the person was in the private sector and they've never been in public office before, but they still have a record. And an example of that was when uh, Bruce Rauner ran for mayor here. I mean, ran for governor here. He was um, a Republican. He was the person who helped Rahm Emanuel make the $18 million he made when he left public office. Mm. And so they're good friends. And I said he had a record. The record was of 51 employees, only one was black. That's a record. So those are the kinds of things we've got to look at. They may be small, but they're large because they speak to who the person is. Uh, Del Marie Cobb, we have about one minute left. Uh, can can the Japanese government say no? Thank you. <laughs> we we can give us a second try. We, you know, can they can they refuse uh, such an ambassador? Well, I don't know that they're happy either, <laughs> given his reputation, because they certainly aren't the types who are vulgar or, um, you know, take embrace hostility. Uh, they, they do it, but they do it differently. They're not, uh, you know, abrasive like he is. And, and so I don't see that this is a winning strategy for America. And I think that as Americans, we should all be upset by this because this is not just a Chicago or Illinois problem. This is an American problem because it speaks to what he believes in terms of black people across the country. Because what he did, I mean, when you talk about the George Floyd Policing Act, I mean, we had the first incident yep. with Laquan McDonald. Yeah. It's it. It's it's we got to put an end to it. Delmarie Cobb, I wish we had more uh, hours to continue. Thank you for your <laughs> great work and thank you for coming on Talk World Radio. And thank you for having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.